It's just right wind, it's just wind and meat runs down the, the backbone. Yeah. Well, just so off the side, side of the yeah, right side. Side. We've got, we've got one. Well, I don't think I do. <laughs> you know what you do? Well, nobody wants my back straight. Steps of Jesus. Yeah, 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 yeah. You said, well, you called me. Huh? Yeah, you did. Now, I wasn't used to this. Pastor Jeff, are you going to want an invitation song at the end of your uh, prayer meeting, Bible study, whatever? I hope I do it. Just get there. Well, just get the message. 
Because all he did was really just Bible study and prayer. Sometimes, 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 sometimes,
and He can still provide. I'm just going to keep trusting Him. I'm going to be happy about it. I'm going to, I'm going to be full of joy. Uh, the Bible says we can have joy unspeakable and full of glory. And, and, and the only time we ever walk around and we have a bad attitude is when we've forgotten that God's still on the throne. God's still the one that, that is holding all these things together. He upholds it by the word of His power. By Him all things consist. So let's, let's not get too focused on everything out there. We can get focused on everything in here. You know, I'm just as guilty as you are. We get our cell phones out and we look at it. And it's a habit. We become addicted to it. Every 10 minutes, every 5 minutes, every couple seconds, we, oh, well, we got to see what's going on. Well, somebody sent me a text message. Somebody called me. So I got a notification, something or another, blah, blah, blah. Now, I know some of us have Bible apps. I use my Bible app. That's good. But if we're honest, 9 times out of 10, if we're on our phone, we are not using a Bible app. But what if, what if we traded our time on our phone and we started picking up our Bible every few minutes? And we started seeing what God posted. And we started looking to see what God had to say. And we're like, oh, you know what? I just got a notification from the Holy Spirit. There's something over here in Proverbs chapter number 13. I'm going to check it out and see what it has to say. Oh, look, I got a friend request. It's Jesus Christ the Lord. I want to go and make sure that I press accept on Him. Uh, you know, <laughs> So if, if we'll treat this Bible like we treat our cell phone, I guarantee you we'd have a whole lot better day. we have a whole lot better relationships. Anyway, but I'm, I'm, I'm preaching, but I'm not preaching, okay? <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to be quiet now. We've got much to pray for. We really do. It's a sad state that our nation is in. But I will say this. We went and we enrolled our son into a Christian school. We had a, a, a talk with um, one of the teachers there. And this is, this is a blessing. You never know. God may be fixing us in revival. Really. You have no idea how many people have taken their kids out of public school. And all these things that are going on right now, all these laws that are being passed, all these, you know, indoctrinating stuff that's going on with, you know, the sexuality and stuff, and it may be the biggest blessing that we've ever seen in this country. Because it, it's taking all these little kids who otherwise would have been subject to the public school education that teaches evolution and, and denies God, instead of, instead of them going into that, people are wising up, saying, well, they can't even figure out what gender they are, so I'm not going to put them in that school, and now... There's such a massive influx of people going to Christian schools. You know what? If God can get a hold of the kids' hearts, there's no telling. There's no telling what He could do here. So this, this, all this craziness going on, doesn't the Bible say that God works together all things for good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose? How many of you pray for our nation? Maybe God is answering your prayers by allowing the reprobates that are in charge of our nation to go full scale, and then causing everyone else that's got a little bit of sense to draw back away from that, and God can use their God can use their disgust with the way that the system is going to turn their children to the truth. And we may you never know. You, you had the millennials; they're a mess. I'm a millennial, so I am a mess. Then you've got the Gen Zers; they're, they're even worse. But the ones that come after them, they, they may be the the ones that do the next reformation. Because instead of going to public school, they all went to Christian school. They were homeschooled. And uh, so you never know. God, God, God's still God. He's still God. And you never know. He may, he may just come tonight. Wouldn't that, that'd be even better. So I'm just going to be thankful for what he's doing. And I'm going to be thankful he's still in charge. We've got plenty of people to pray for. I've said that several times. Uh, but we've got plenty of other things to pray for. Pray for the church. Pray for me, please. Pray for my family. My wife and kids aren't here this evening because they're at a VBS at our home church at White Graves, and uh, we praise the Lord for that. Uh, able to take Kyle with them. He's been enjoying it as well. And uh, so just pray for them and that God will work in their hearts. And uh, my wife's been helping down there, of course. So pray for her. She's getting run over by these little kids. <laughs> they, I think they had 91 kids sign up for the VBS. So that's a, that's a blessing. We praise the Lord for that. Um, but anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray, and then I'll get out of the way. Brother Terry can lead us in a song. Dear Father in heaven, we come before you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for being God. Thank you for being who you are, Lord, for never changing. Lord, there's, there's no Supreme Court that's going to cause you to, to do anything different. There's, there's no lawmaker that's going to make you change your mind on anything. We thank you, God, that you just stay the same. Lord, we pray, God, you'd please just help us to live according to your word. Lord, help us, God, not to be driven about with every wind of doctrine, Lord. And I pray you'd help us not to be driven about with every wind of emotion. It seems that, that thing, those things are running high these days. And, uh, Lord, we, 
We feel like every time we turn around, we, we hear somebody say something. It's a trigger word. It's uh, trying to get our, us all riled up, Lord. To get, you know, it's just an attempt by the devil to get our eyes off of you. Lord, please help us to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And I pray that your will would be done in each and every one of us, God. We'd, we'd, we just ask that you'd help us to glorify you in our bodies, in our spirits, in our minds. And, uh, Lord, we'd, we'd pray, Father, you'd just sanctify your truth in our heart. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Oh. Let's get our songbooks and uh, turn to page number 117, 117. Amen. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain, <coughs> nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that <coughs> there's no, no other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Moody C. Hey, man, I'm thankful for Jesus this evening. For what for him, I don't know where I'd be if I was still if I was still alive. I certainly don't know what I'd be doing. But if it wasn't for him, and I wasn't here right now, if I was my life was gone, I'd be in hell for sure. So I'm thankful for his saving grace. Take your Bibles, if you will. We're going to turn to several different places tonight. I hope that's okay. But I'll give you plenty of time to get there. Will you, will you please take your Bibles tonight and turn to First John, First John chapter five, First John chapter five. The Bible says in Second Peter chapter one that we've been given exceeding great and precious promises, exceeding great and precious promises. Now, it's a blessing that God would promise us anything, but I'm, I'm really excited about what we're about to see in the Scripture tonight. Now, I'm getting to a point, um, but it's, I got a long a long introduction, but a short message. And uh, I believe once we, once we see what God has to say about a few things, it'll make a little bit more sense as we see what God has to say from His Word. So blessing to have Miss Crystal again here with us tonight. Got baptized on Monday, praise the Lord, and uh, she she followed the Lord and believed baptism. She uh, put her faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. She wanted to be obedient to Him, and and uh, here she is again tonight, wanting to learn something from the Scriptures. So I'm I'm thankful for that. And uh, there's there's nothing better than than being saved, and there's nothing better than being saved and serving. I tell you what, God is good, and uh, I just pray that I can still be as hungry as she is, and I want to make sure that I continue uh, to listen and continue to learn. Uh, tonight, if you will, I'm going to read in 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 11. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 11, And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and His life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. That's the record. If you've got Jesus, you have got life. The Bible says, For the wages of sin is death, 
but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So if you've got the Lord, you've really got something. It's, and, it, and it's something good. But uh, if you'll read with me in verse number 13, it says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. God wants us to have assurance of our standing before God. He wants us to know that we do have it. We possess it. We've, we've been given it from God. That's one of His exceeding great and precious promises. God is a security guard. And once you get saved, He's never going to allow you to lose it. He's able, the Bible says in the book of Jude, to keep you from falling. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask for. Thank Yes, we think about that in, in accordance to blessings. But when we think about our salvation, the Bible says in John chapter 10, and verse 28, that the, no man can pluck us out of the Father's hand. And, and, and I'm thankful for that. But look at the last part of verse number 13. And that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So he's talking to those who already believe. And he says, I want you to know something. You've got, you've got eternal life. And you possess it. And then he follows it up says, And I, I want you to know that after you've believed on the Lord and you, you, you possess eternal life now, I want you to keep believing on the Lord. Don't stop believing. Keep going. Keep putting your faith and trust in Him. He's able to keep you from falling. He's able to, to keep you to stand firm in the faith. He's able to do that. And you know, a lot of people, they, they, they really get hung up on that word eternal. They don't seem to know what it means because when, when they read eternal life, they, they see conditional life. But if we'll cross-reference the Scriptures, it tells us over in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13 that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Once we've been saved, we've been secured, we've been sealed. We have not only been delivered from our present darkness, but God has held us until Jesus comes. The Bible says in uh, see, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 that he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So God promises security. That is an exceeding great and precious promise. But the Bible says here in, in several different places, if you will take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter number 6. Matthew chapter number 6. God promises to supply our temporal needs. He does. Now, as you're turning there, I'm going to mention this. Psalm 37 and verse 25, the, the Bible says, Matthew chapter 6 is where you're going, but I'm going to read you something from Psalms. Uh, Psalm 37 and verse 25, the, uh, the, the King, King David said, he has never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. Now, if we're honest, we look at ourselves and our lives, we can say, well, that certainly can't apply to me because <laughs> I've done some unrighteous stuff, even after I was saved. But the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, according as He has chosen us in Him. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the righteous. So if we're in Him, and He is righteous, and we look over there in Hebrews chapter 2, like we did uh, last evening, we were here in Sunday evening, we saw the unity that the brethren has to the Lord, and we're not only in Him, but we are the offspring of God, we are the children of the Lord. It says, He's never seen the righteous forsaken. Jesus is never going to be forsaken by God, except for when He died for our sins. He's not seen the righteous forsaken, nor His seed begging bread. The Bible says, As many as received Him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. God has promised to provide for you and I while we're here on the earth. Now, I didn't say that He was going to give us 85-inch flat-screen TVs and 4K resolution. And I didn't say that He was going to give us Swiss rolls and, and Doritos or anything like that. But He said He'll make sure that He'll sustain us throughout the day. That's, that's a blessing. I'm, I'm glad to know that. Uh, and and, and we, we praise the Lord. We praise the Lord. We've got unity in Him, and we see that. Matthew chapter number 6, I'd like to read this to you. Matthew chapter number uh, 6 and verse number 25. The Bible says, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat? And the body more than raiment? It it in life more than just trying to find some food and get some clothes. I hope it is for you. I hope it is for you. If you're living for God, the Bible says it should be. It's more than just waking up trying to find something to eat and get some clothes. Now, there's some people that live in predicaments where that may be their existence. 
But if you know God, the Bible says it's supposed to be more than that. Verse number 26, Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet our heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? He said he's the one. He, over in the book of Job, and Job's trying to argue with God about who God is and whether he's good or not. And God said, well, well can, you, can you keep the calves fed? Can you, can you sustain all the animals in the wilderness? Can you make sure that they don't go hungry? And here we see again Jesus saying, look, look at the birds. None of them have tractors. None of them have farms. None of them have barns to put food into. Like they're, They don't have refrigerators, but God still keeps them fed. He said, aren't, I, I made you in my image. Aren't you better than they? What are you worried about? Don't you trust me? Didn't we talk about that a couple Sundays ago? Trust in God because of who He is, because He is good. Verse number 27. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Now, can any of us, if we just thought as hard as we could, can make ourselves any taller? None of us. And no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get all the hair that I used to have back onto my head. It's just not going to happen. It's fell out. At, my, my wife was asking if anybody had any loose change because they were, they were doing some uh, stuff at the VBS. I said, I don't have you that. I got some loose hair. I give that to you. But no matter how hard I tried, or even if I went through the process of buying special shampoos or, or anything, I can't keep my hair even from falling out. And so the Lord is asking them a rhetorical question. So, if you can't even add a cubit to your stature, why waste any time wondering how you're going to get food? Why waste any time wondering how you're going to make it throughout the day? Why not just trust God? Isn't God going to be the one that's going to make you grow anyway? Verse number 28. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. They're not over there on the loom trying to make a dress. They're not trying to make some blue jeans. They just, they just grow up, and it says, And yet I say unto you that even Solomon, anybody remember him? That's the guy that had a lot of wives. He, he's, he, he's in a bad way, but he was rich. He said, And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. God said, I, I spent more time decorating these flowers, and I put it in their DNA when they grow up. They're just going to be beautiful. And, and Solomon traveled the world, sent people out, mercenaries, people to find things, said, try to bring it all back to him and, and make the finest garments. Said, he didn't even have stuff as good as I made for these flowers. And you're worried about stuff? He said, cast all your care upon me, because I care about you. Stop with the word. Be, be careful for nothing. But in everything, by supplication and prayer, make your requests known unto God. Verse number 29, And I say unto you that he, or excuse me, verse number 30, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O oh, ye of little faith. Therefore, take no thought. That's hard to do, isn't it? It's hard. It is hard. Some, you ever come to the Bible, and you're trying to read it, and you're trying to comprehend it, and you, you really are. You're trying to be spiritual. You're trying to, shut, you're trying to shut all the thought off. That way you can focus on His Word and you just can't get your mind to calm down and you almost get aggravated. But here He's telling us, take no thought. Just, just cast all you worry off. Saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Where are we going to get toilet paper from? He said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Verse number 32, for all these things do the Gentiles seek... The Bible said, if you're acting like that, you're acting like a heathen. Is that they, they say that up here, heathens, with the R in it. I don't know where they get that from, but heathen. You're acting like a heathen if, you, if you're just doing that. And like a barbarian. If, you, if you're running around worried about all these things, says, for your heavenly Father, are you saved tonight? Are you, if you're saved, you've got a heavenly Father. Remember, our Father which art in heaven, He can see better than we can. He can provide. We, he is everything, and we need Him because we go up to Him and we ask Him, say, Lord, can you give us some bread today? And He can do that. If, if, if a man, being evil, knows how to give his son a fish, you think God's going to give you something worse than what you asked for? It says, knowing that ye have need of all these things. Verse number 33. So what are we supposed to be concerned about? But seek ye first the kingdom of God. And His righteousness, 
and all these things shall be added unto you. So the thing which our mind should be preoccupied about on a regular basis is not our survival. It's on the furtherance of the gospel. It's on the furtherance of God's word. And, and so we're thankful. We, we have God's promise for security when we're saved. We, we've got promises from God that He's going to supply our temporal needs. You know, if, if gas goes to $10 a gallon, God forbid it does. If, if milk goes to $15 a jug, if, if inflation goes 500%, I think we're already there, but... <laughs> If it gets any worse than it is, God's not worried about it. You know that one preacher said it like this, God is the one who hid the gold in the dirt to be in the hills. You know, God's never went through a recession. He's never went bankrupt. You know, the only inflation that God is concerned about is you being filled with the Spirit. That's what God's concerned about. So God promises security eternally with our salvation. God supplies promises to supply our temporal needs. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Yes, yes it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll have to read verse 19 just because. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. I always thought it was weird. I remember the first time I heard a preacher say chapter number, and I thought, why didn't he say that? That's redundant. It's the same thing. Here I am doing it. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. I'll read verse 19 just for Brother Keith. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Now, there's no truer statement than that. That's true. If Jesus, if Jesus died for our sins, but it didn't secure us a place in heaven, that would be pretty miserable. If, if that, that would be a sad way to be. Let's read over here in verse number 52. The Bible says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. There's a glad reunion day coming, and it'll be before we even get to heaven. We'll, we'll meet our loved ones here on the earth right before we get shot up like a rocket to heaven. And that's, that's exciting. We, so we, we sing that song, Glad Reunion Day, while we we'll get together in heaven. No, the Bible says in a moment, we can divide, we'll, we'll, we'll be right here on the earth. And we'll get to meet Him and go up together with Him. That's, that's a blessed hope, isn't it? That's a wonderful thing. Verse number 50, 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory i used to always read that and i said this mortal must put on immorality you know <laughs> because i forgot the t there's a difference in just in case but god promises to alleviate our physical maladies he says he says Whatever you've got going on in your body right now, whatever aches and pains and hurts and whatever emotional distress that you may be under, whatever type of mental thing that you've got going on, the Bible says this corruptible will be made incorruptible. That means if you've got some decay going on in your body, maybe maybe your chompers aren't working like they used to, maybe you can't hear as well as you say, so don't worry. It may be dying because that's our body of death. It's, it, God didn't save our physical body. He saved our soul. They said, one day, one day, this physical body that's corruptible, it's going to be made, it's going to be changed, it's going to be incorruptible. And it says this mortality is going to come immortal. To never, Death will be swallowed up in victory. So God promises security. God promises to supply our temporal needs. And He promises to alleviate every physical problem that we've ever encountered. Pretty good God. Pretty exciting things to know. God promises eternal bliss. In uh, Revelation chapter 21, He said He's going to wipe away all tears. He said there's going to be no sorrow. We're going to have free access to the tree of life. We're going to be in the presence of God. We're, we're promised in John chapter 14, Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you, that where I am there you may be also. And it's not a dwelling place, it's a mansion. Praise God, isn't that good? I'm glad it's a mansion, not a dwelling place. But it's amazing. The exceeding great and precious promises. From God. 
that in the meantime, we've talked last week on Wednesday about uh, abiding in Christ, bearing fruit, being fruitful, talking about what happens. He may come and He may prune. But did you know that God promises to supply the source of a fruitful Christian life? All we've got to do is abide in Him. I mentioned it already. And in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 says, He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We know that to be true. I know whom I have believed and persuaded that He is able to keep that which I have committed unto Him against that day. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 says, We're blessed with all spiritual blessings. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm glad to be saved tonight. I mean, we, we just looked, we're just scratching the surface, and God is just so good. Aren't you glad we're not in 1 Corinthians tonight? Amen. I'm afraid to say yes. It's okay. We won't hurt my feelings. I didn't write the Bible. <laughs> what? No. <laughs> Second Peter chapter 1. <laughs> Second Peter chapter 1. I'm in Ephesians. That's right. That's right. He. Uh, that's in in First John chapter two, I think. This purify him as even as he is pure. Yeah. Second Peter. That's past Hebrews. It's past James. Second Peter. It's in the New Testament. I promise. Second Peter chapter one. These first four verses. I mean, you, uh, we ought to just go ahead and run around the building a couple times after I read it, but we probably won't. But we'll, we'll do that in our mind. First Peter or Second Peter chapter one and verse one. The Bible says, Simon Peter a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, what could be a better occupation than that? We, we just read about somebody pretty amazing. And he he's saying, I'm, I'm a servant. I'm an apostle of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What a blessing. To them that have attained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. There's another point where you can say, people say, well, Jesus didn't ever claim to be God. Well, here it is. God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. There you go, verse number 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. One of the things that my wife was worried about before she got saved, she was, she was very concerned that she wouldn't be able to live it. She was. And she was saved like she was saved when she was 25. I was saved when I was 13, so I didn't know anything about living. I just knew I needed to get a Savior before I went to hell. Praise God. But she was, she didn't want to be a hypocrite. And she was concerned about not being able to live it. But right here, the Bible says, in the medicine is the cure. The salvation that God gives, He, 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 lo he's, he's, he loaded us down with benefits. And, and he, he gave her everything that she needed. It says right here in verse number 3, According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. By the way, my wife is the godliest person I know. Verse number 4, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That's familiar, isn't it? That by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. That's what God wants you to do. He wants you to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. It's almost like the Bible in the New Testament is all about the same thing, isn't it? Get saved and get right. Get saved, get right. Get saved. I can think of another word that starts with S, but I didn't, I didn't do that. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Verse number 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. That means that after you're saved, you're supposed to be diligently trying to add to what God has given you. Not to earn salvation, because you've been given it by grace. But Jesus said in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, and you think, well, I thought Paul wrote Ephesians. Well, no, God wrote the, wrote the Bible. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, tells that we're saved by grace through faith. But if we look at verse number 10, it says, we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works, that we were foreordained to abide, walk therein. Uh, so He wants us to add to our faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. You know, now here it is. You might give yourself away. The Bible says you got to be patient before you can be godly. So if I ever see any of you being impatient, 
I know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Nah, I'm just kidding. And to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Verse number eight, listen, this is a remedy to all your problems. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a blessing. That's amazing. Now these are extraordinary promises. They're astounding, they're lofty in their claims. I've, I've had some people make some promises to me before. I have. And they broke them. And they didn't follow through. They didn't do what they said they were going to do. They didn't show up on time. They didn't pay me back. And they, they I mean, they could just speak just as well as you could possibly imagine. They, they had all the veneer about them, but it didn't hold up. It didn't hold water. They're like what the, the Bible talks about in the book of Jeremiah. They're broken cisterns. You pour in and pour in. You ever have somebody like that in your life? You just pour in and pour in and pour in and pour in. It's like they're always empty. Can, can you give me some more? Can you give me some more? The Bible says a horse leech in the, in the book of Proverbs says it never has enough. It says give, 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 give. Come on, give me some more. You know, there's a lot of people that make promises. But God's made us some promises. And I'm, I'm, I'm proud to report, I'm not proud of myself, I'm proud of the Lord, but in Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, the Bible says that God cannot lie. He cannot. And in Hebrews chapter 6, if you'll turn there quickly, Hebrews chapter 6, in Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, it says, He cannot lie. In Hebrews chapter number 6 and verse 17, the Bible says, Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of His counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, that word immutable means just it can't change. It's unchanging. It's steadfast. It's unmovable. It cannot be changed. It can't be deferred. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which we hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. So Titus says cannot. Hebrews says impossible. If somebody was going to make me a promise, I want somebody that, that cannot lie or impossible to lie. I mean, that, that, that's good. That means that whatever he has to say from here on out, I'm going to be able to trust it because he, it's not in his character. It's not like us. The motions of sin are in our members. We, we can be tempted to sin because we want to sin. The Bible says God's not capable of sinning. That's how holy he is. So I, I'm, going to, I'm going to trust him. And take note of this word in verse number 18. It says, we might have a strong consolation. That word consolation means alleviation of misery or distress of mind. So we have a hope as an anchor. And the Bible says that, that is our consolation. It's an alleviation of our mind. Wouldn't it be a relief to you if whenever you saw the news, I recommend, you know, Dialing back the news intake a good bit, probably like at least 99.5%. But whenever you saw the news, your consolation could be, whew, I'm glad Jesus is going to take care of that. That's, that's good, isn't it? It really is. I mean, just to see all this crazy stuff over there and you just wipe the sweat off your brass. Like, I'm glad God's going to handle that. That's pretty good consolation, isn't it? I, I'm glad I've got a blessed hope and in the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm going to keep my mind focused on that. We can rightly think of the term consolation like it's used as a consolation prize. When you're in the midst of a great trial, but you come short of maybe overcoming the obstacle, you can, you can at that same time think, I may have not gotten victory right now, but my strong consolation 
is that one day there will be no trouble. One day there will be no trial. One day there will be no struggle to overcome unrighteousness, whether it be from without or from within. That's a good, that's a good thing to keep hold of. The Bible says in first Tim, or 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19, the foundation of God standeth sure. The foundation of God is Jesus Christ. He's our chief cornerstone. And, and you look in Isaiah chapter number 28, verses 12 and 13, or excuse me, 16 and 17. It says that they set this cornerstone down and it's supposed to be the part, the very beginning of a building and, and they use it in two different ways. They use it as a measuring line laterally and they use it as a plumb line vertically. And God said that He set judgment by the measuring line. And He's set uh, uh, righteousness by the plumb line, by the vertical. So the lateral is judgment, the vertical is uh, uh, can't think, righteousness. You know what we're going to gate, what God's gauge in judgment and righteousness? Jesus Christ. Can't lie. The foundation of God standeth sure. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11 that no other foundation can man lay other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. I mean, we're, we've got a great God. We've got great promises. And, and from what we can tell, He's always held true. So all we've got to do is continue believing on God, just like it says in 1 John chapter 5. I've written these things that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. And then at the end of it, it says that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. He wants us to keep on believing. Now, the battle may from time to time be lost. It really, it really might. But the war is won. Jesus did that on the cross. He took care of that. He, he, took back, uh, he took the keys of death and hell. He took back the crown from the devil. He's got the title deed to the universe. And he's just waiting right now. He said, long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should, should come to repentance. The only reason he hadn't stepped in to take over yet is because for all the wickedness and all the abominable things going on in people's hearts and people's lives, he said, I still want them to be saved. I still want them to come to the knowledge of the truth. Turn with me quickly. Hold your place in 2 Peter. Don't lose it. Wait, maybe you already did because you're in Hebrews. <laughs> Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. That's okay. We'll all turn back there together. Matthew chapter 17. I'm exercising your Bible tonight. If you had any pages sticking together, you'll get it figured out tonight, okay? Matthew chapter number 17. Long introduction. There's a short. My, I'm actually preaching out of Psalm 119 tonight. Believe it or not, we just haven't got there yet. Now I'm not preaching all 176 verses. Don't get scared. I promise. All right. Matthew chapter number 17. What have we been talking about this whole time? God's promises. When God speaks, what is that called? God's word. So God's promises is God's word. Now, we're going to read in Matthew chapter number 17. There's an amazing thing that happened with Peter, James, and John. Verse number 1 says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Now, could you imagine seeing the Son of God in His, his glory? Like that? That would be an amazing thing to see. Verse number 3. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Now that's, that's the New Testament rendering of the word Elijah. Verse number 4. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. And there you go. If you're the big mouth, you're going to get in trouble. And Peter was the big mouth, and he stuck his foot in it often. And uh, there, there they saw Jesus for the first time in His glory, and He said, well, let's make one for you, but then don't forget Moses and Elijah too. You know, we're going to make one for them too. Verse number 5, While He yet spake, before Peter could even finish his sentence, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. Now listen, God 
loves you. He does. They were trembling in fear. And the hand that created them in the womb touched them and said, Don't be afraid. That's amazing. Verse number 8. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. That's what we need to do. We need to stop looking at everybody else. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And if we'll quit looking at everybody else and look at Jesus, we'll have sweet fellowship with Him. He'll remind us, don't be afraid, I love you. Don't be afraid, I love you. All right, now, Second Peter. We were just there, but we're going back. I had to let you read that. That way you get the context of what uh, the Apostle Peter is saying here. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. Remember, we're, we're talking about God's Word. But we just heard about Jesus being transfigured before the face of three apostles, seeing Him in their glory, in His glory, excuse me. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 16, the Bible says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Eyewitnesses. They saw Jesus for who He really was on that mount, shining brightly. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, and verse 3, that He's the brightness of His glory, the express image of His person. So look, I'm not telling you all guys just a big tall tale. We were there. We saw it in person. Verse number 17. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, where there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Now, what a testimony. You'd like to go to a testimony meeting and hear somebody talk about that, wouldn't you? <laughs> That'd be pretty good. I've been to a testimony meeting where people were talking about seeing little salamanders in the creek. I'm not joking. I really have. But I'd like to hear somebody testify like that. But look at verse number 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. You know what he just did there? The Apostle Peter took the experience that he had on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he said, this was great. It was wonderful. We testify to it. But also, we've got God's Word. And he said, it's more sure. How could that be? How could that be? Because you know what? One day, Peter's memory might mess up. One day, John might be able to call. One day, he may be dead. But the Word of God liveth and abideth forever. What an incredible thing that he would say that seeing Jesus in His full glory is actually less sure. I'm not taking away from the Lord. This is, God wrote His Word. Less sure than having His Word before us. And the Bible says that God esteems His own Word above His name. Now, where do you think you're going to find the solution to your distress? Where do you think you're going to get over all your heartaches? Where are you going to get direction for your each and every day? Because I promise, I promise, CNN ain't going to help you. And we all know that, you know. But Fox News ain't going to help you neither. I'm telling you, it's right here on, uh, I think it's channel 1611, King James, right here. English version. Amen. Psalm 119. Almost done. Psalm 119. If you will turn there with me, please. Psalm 119. Regardless of our feelings, regardless of our circumstances, we can stand on the promises of God. I've got a lot more to say tonight, but... I guess I'll cut it short. 
We've got three more pages. I'm only halfway done with the second page. Brother Terry's, he said, he don't know about that. I hear him back here. <laughs> 119, verse number 81, excuse me. I didn't tell you that. It's a long chapter. I was going to let you figure it out. <laughs> Psalm 119. Now, this is an interesting chapter in the Bible. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. There are 176 verses in this chapter. There's more verses than there are the actual number. And so uh, there's actually something interesting that's happening. It's, it's an acrostic of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, I don't know Hebrew. I'm not going to tell you what the letters are, but there's, there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And there's eight verses for each section, and they all start with that same letter of the alphabet. Now, it would probably be beautiful, be beautiful poetry if we could read Hebrew, but I'm, I praise God that we got English because I can barely read that, but I can read it. Verse number 81. My soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. Mine eyes fail for thy word, saying, When wilt thou comfort me? For I am become like a bottle in the smoke. Yet do I not forget thy statutes. How many are the days of thy servant? When wilt thou execute judgment on them that persecute me? The proud have digged their pits for me, which are not after thy law. All thy commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongfully. Help thou me. They had almost consumed me upon the earth, upon earth, but I forsook not thy precept. Quicken me after thy loving kindness, so shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. Now there's a lot of preaching in that verse or that, that section, but some have said that this 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 particular section, this is the eleventh out of twenty two. It's right smack dab in the middle. They say that it's the midnight of this psalm. It's, it's the midnight of Psalm 119. He's almost to the point of giving up. He's almost to the point of throwing in his towel. His soul is fainting. His eyes are failing. He is being persecuted wrongfully. The wicked have dug pits for him to fall in. They've made an end of him almost, it seems. He's, he's definitely feeling the darkness. You know, some have said that the, the darkest hour is right before the dawn. But that's not true. Sometimes the dawn doesn't come. Sometimes the dark just stays. Sometimes it's years on end. Consider the afflictions of some of our brethren and, and sisters. Cancer, disease, ailments. And seemingly, I'm, I'm thinking of one dear sister at the moment, this, it just won't let up. What do you do? What do they do when the night never seems to end? What do you do? But even in the darkest of night, it seems that one star still always shines through. The Bible said in 2 Peter that the day star would arise in our hearts. It's talking about that Word of God. The Bible says it will be a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, you know, we, you didn't realize you was holding a flashlight, did you? you? Didn't realize that you had a lamp in your hand when you was reading the Word of God. You don't even you read it in the dark, literally. If you get it, one of those glow in the dark Bibles, I don't have one of those, but this this you can it can be just as dark as it is outside, and you know what? You can have peace with God. You can you can you can have a, a great you can have joy unspeakable and full of glory, even though other people can't even identify their own gender. Really? You can. This is page number 777 in my Bible. What a blessing. And it's right here when somebody is going through what appears to be the worst time they've ever been in. But we've got a promise from God that He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. Look at what he said in verse number 81. It says, My soul fainteth. Now, we could, we could make up all types of stuff. We could try to explain that, but all of us know what that means. Just, man, what in the world? 
My soul fainteth. And we just sometimes we just feel like giving up, giving in, giving out. And we feel exhausted. Every facet of our own strength is gone. We've tried to combat every trial of life and it's not been successful. You know, you look at the world, honestly. We can, and rightfully so, be angry, be aggravated, be upset. We look at some of the decisions, maybe even some of our own family members are making to think, what are, what are they thinking? What are they doing? Why are they going that direction? Can't they see? And I'm reminded of a verse in Ezekiel. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Really, it's, it feels like there's a, there's a... And I'm not trying to say that we're the nation of Israel, okay? We're not. But it feels like there's a general groan coming out of the, the, the mouths of those who have common sense. What is, what is happening? And we could say our soul is fainting from this onslaught day after day after day after day, but... There's an inclination here in the psalmist's heart. It says, my soul fainteth for. You know, we're all longing for something. We're all headed for a direction. We're, we, we all want some type of leaf. Look at what he's looking to. My soul fainteth for my salvation. When we come to the end of the we forget that the Lord Jesus Christ is out there holding both hands to save us from the fall. God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. And when our soul thinks within us, we're supposed to rest upon the promises of God. Are you doing that tonight? Can you be like the psalmist here said, it goes on to say, my soul fainteth for thy salvation. Lord, I'm ready for you to save me. Can't we all say, Lord, please come back tonight. Amen. Rapture ready. I'm, I'm ready. I saw one thing on the internet one time. It said, you can put a rapture hatch in your house. That way, in case he comes, you won't hit your roof on, your head on the roof, you know. Amen. We're ready for it. My soul fainteth. It's not, I'm, I'm not fainting looking for relief from a new president. I'm not fainting looking for relief from a new representative. I'm, I'm, I'm not fainting looking for relief from I'm, I'm, I'm looking for relief from God. I'm ready for His salvation to be made perfect in me to where no more I will have to dwell in this sin-cursed earth. No more will I have to dwell in this body of sinful flesh. Is that a blessing? But the last part says, but I hope. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You may not be able to see right now or understand what's going on right now. And, and, and the psalmist said here, I'm waiting for you to come save me out of this mess. He's looking to God. That's the right direction. We're supposed to keep our eyes on the author and finisher of our faith. We know that. Thank God he's doing that. But he said, in the meantime, even though you, I'm crying unto you, I'm asking you to help me, but you're not giving me any relief yet. But I, in the meantime, he says, but I hope in thy word. You trust God tonight. Are you leaning on His everlasting arms? I promise you, you're not going to get any peaceful sleep tonight if you're going to rest on what a commentator has to say. There's going to be no Supreme Court ruling that will allow you to have joy. You've got to get that from God, and you've got to get that by trusting His Word. Tell you, we, we live in a day where everybody is trying. The Bible says that God's given to every man the measure of faith. We've all got the same measure. He's given us the measure of faith. And everybody is trying to get us to exercise it over here or over here or over here. They, they, want, they want our attention. They want to occupy our mind. They want to tell you, I've got the solution for your problem, but it's all this direction. God said, this is the way that you need to look. Straight up. Straight up. But I hope in thy word. So I encourage you tonight. God's still God. We've got exceeding great and precious promises. Uh, you know, I, I went over a couple here. We, we, he says he promises us security. Amen. He, he promises us our temporal needs to be met. Amen. God promises to alleviate 
our physical condition. Amen. Praise the Lord. He promises eternal bliss. And He said, in the meantime, I'll supply everything you need to live the Christian life. Stay in the Bible. Stay in the Bible. Trust Him. Let's pray. Father, we come before You in Jesus' name tonight. We thank You for the reminder. Thank You, Lord. Uh, we're, we're so very thankful of the, the written Word. We thank You for all the, the wonderful things that are put there in the Bible, all the things we get to see and all the things we get to understand. But we're, we're, we're encouraged tonight of who You are. And I pray You'd help us, Father, not to be uh, wrapped up with all the things going on in this wicked world. Lord, help us to be wrapped up in You. Lord, help us walk in the Spirit, not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, we won't have an altar call tonight, but I pray that you'll seek the Lord. And maybe maybe if you're uh, feeling like you're lingering a little bit too long on 